Okay, so welcome everyone to the 15th edition of the Global Medical Physics Educational Series. Uh, I am very, very happy to introduce Dr. Sam Einstein. So we used to be colleagues a few years ago at the same hospital, and now we work very, very uh, close together um, in, in sort of opportunities at Rad Aid International. Uh, so I'm very, very uh, happy to introduce him and look forward to hearing what he has to say about MRI safety, which is a very important topic. So Dr. Einstein, take it away. Thank you, Joe. Yes, my name is Sam. Uh, my email is einstein at psu.edu if you ever have any questions about this. And so we're gonna go through some of the random stuff about MR safety. Uh, please feel free to interrupt uh, or, or start some conversations in the middle of the lecture, that's fine. I'll also save time at the end for questions as well. Let's see. There we go. Uh, some quick disclaimers. I mean, I have no financial disclosures, uh, but this is for educational purposes. I did my best to make sure there are no errors, but please double check everything I say and don't take it uh, at face value necessarily. Question everything. I may also reference certain products that should not be interpreted as an endorsement. And my views, of course, are not necessarily those of my employer. And I will be discussing some off-label use of medical devices. So why are we doing this? Why are we here learning MR safety? So MR is free from the hazards of ionizing radiation that we'd see in CT or X-ray, but it introduces other unique risks. And these risks can certainly result in serious injury or even death to patients or staff working in the MR environment. Uh, here in the U.S., we see about two or three deaths per year caused by MRI. And uh, this is only kind of getting worse. Uh, increased MR utilization, along with higher field strengths, going up to 17 now in the U.S., and faster volume imaging techniques. They're increasing both the risks and the number of people exposed to the risks. And so we're starting to see more and more uh, potential MRI accidents. And although these risks cannot be avoided, we can mitigate them and uh, to make sure we have safe scanning. And that's kind of the goal of MR safety is to balance the risks and uh, say, scan as safely as possible. So today I'm gonna talk a bit about the basics of MR safety and the physics of MR safety. I'm also gonna talk about some new stuff that's been happening recently in MR safety. And I'm gonna talk a bit about the philosophy of MR safety. And so these are not gonna necessarily be linearly, they're all gonna be kind of meshed together. I think you could talk about MR safety for weeks. I, I personally have talked about MR safety for a lot longer than an hour straight before. And so I'm just gonna highlight a few things that are kind of on my mind, but feel free to ask questions. Also know this is no way comprehensive. There's no way to do a comprehensive uh, study of MR safety in, in under an hour. Um, but I wanted to at least give you the, the basics and the kind of the biggest hits. And so I think one thing I wanna stress right away is uh, the change in MRI safety over the years. I've been doing this for almost 20 years now and MRI safety has changed a lot during that time. Uh, when I first started, uh, we, we kind of denied everything, right? If a patient had any sort of active or passive device, any sort of cardiac device, stimulator, pain uh, pump, cochlear implant, we just said no MRI uh, right there. And even like some passive devices, especially aneurysm clips, we were very worried about. Um, all that stuff got denied 15 years ago. 10 years ago, we were starting to do more stuff, um, but still we didn't do scan a lot of active devices. Um, no DBS for sure, no pain pumps. Uh, but today, I mean, we scan everything. I, I can't think of an absolute contraindication. There's certainly some patients I wouldn't scan because the risks uh, exceed the benefits for that patient but I cannot think of a single device or implant or on plant uh, that is an absolute contraindication. I will at least consider MRI for every patient at this point. And so that's, that's a big change from where we started. And so I work with a lot of facilities on their MR safety culture, and I see a whole spectrum um, ranging from complete disregard to patient safety, I'd say, where they kind of scan everything without even thinking about it. Uh, to uh, what they refer to as no risk, um, where they don't scan hardly anything back the way we practiced MRI when I first started 20 years ago. 
I, I that is in quotes because I would argue that it's not actually no risk because uh, you're denying MRI to a whole lot of people. And so I, I, I would argue that being at either end uh, can endanger your patients. So we try to aim for somewhere in the middle where we're balancing uh, the risks and mitigating the risks, um, uh, but, but certainly accepting that there are some risks to MRI. Uh, what do I mean by those risks? I mean that there's definitely patient impact to not scanning patients, right? Uh, we see about 10 to 20% of our MRI patients have some sort of implant or on plant. So in the US, about 300,000 patients every year are denied access to MRI because of an implant. That is serious uh, impact, right? Because what if this patient had a tumor that we're now going to discover later, you know, or not uh, scan them at all? That creates a serious morbidity and mortality as well, denying MRI. And I uh, will note most of these are CIEDs uh, in the United States. So what is a CIED? This is a cardiovascular implantable electronic device. And so think of these as pacemakers, implantable uh, defibrillators, that sort of thing. So these devices are broadly classified as MR conditional or non-MR conditional, which we sometimes call legacy devices. And the large body of research to date has actually demonstrated that both types of devices are low risk uh, from a physics radiology perspective if you take uh, proper precautions. That is key. You have to certainly do certain things when you scan them um, but they can be scanned uh, low risk. And so it's so uh, accepted now that in the United States here, we get reimbursed uh, for both conditional and non-conditional devices. Emerging research is also demonstrating that scanning abandoned leads um, is likely safer than extracting pacing leads uh, if you follow the proper procedures, though this is still not covered by CMS. So I mentioned that despite uh, the lower risk, if you do this right, most patients are still getting denied uh, for CIED scanning. In the United States, it's about 300,000 per year, but this is a global seminar. Um, so we're going to talk about some other countries too. In the UK, 49 out of 50 people with a heart device aren't getting offered an MRI scan when needed. Um, this is just showing that a different way from a different study. Uh, over time, the, the white is 2014-2015, uh, and the black is 2018-2019, and you can see that still about half of uh, facilities in the UK are not offering uh, CIED scanning. In Italy, uh, oh, about 71% um, of patients with ICDs are still getting denied, and almost 20% of patients with pacemakers, um, and that's mostly by radiology, and mostly because uh, they just don't know any better. It's it's just a lack of education. And so this is problematic. Uh, Australia too, uh, right? 35 tertiary referral public hospitals were surveyed while 90% offered MRI for MR conditional CIEDs, which is fantastic. Only uh, less than 10% offered MRI for non-conditional CIEDs. So um, that is a problem. And I talked about the principal barriers uh, being absence of guidelines, lack of formal training, and logistical dev device support, sorry. And so the point I'm trying to get at here is that no risk MRI has serious consequences for patient safety and access to MRI because uh, denying MRI is risk in and of itself. And so I wanna make sure we're being careful that our goal with MRI is to maximize, right, a benefit while minimizing risk, but no risk is actually kind of risky, so. I, I hope that made sense. I want to go through a bit of the basics of MR safety. Some of these slides are courtesy of Mary Ellen Jafari, who I work with sometimes. And we actually uh, both do MR safety lectures. We send slides back and forth to each other. So I honestly cannot remember whose slides are whose at some point, but uh, some of them are definitely hers. So this is the 2020 ACR MR safety manual. And so this is kind of the gold standard for MR safety right now, uh, pretty much everywhere. There is a new MR safety manual coming out from the ACR. It, I've been told uh, even yesterday that it is coming out soon, but I've been hearing that for six months. Um, so we'll, we'll see. Uh, but in the meantime, this is what's on their website and what's published. So uh, sites that are accredited by the ACR have to follow this manual, but other sites kind of should be following it as best practice. Uh, as I noted, a complete overhaul is in the works. 
And it's, it's good stuff in the new manual, mostly. I, I did have a lot of concerns, but generally we follow this manual. Uh, that being said, there are some things I don't follow with this manual as well. Uh, there, there are some things I don't agree with. Uh, you kind of always have to think for yourself, right? Uh, to paraphrase Dickinson Richards, who is the father of cardiac catheterization, uh, we're healthcare professionals. We're not priests. And so, um, uh, what the heck, I'll just quote him. Let's see. <laughs> So let's see, the differences are basic. A priesthood is concerned as it should be with tradition and with rites and symbols and with his own hierarchical secession, both in respect of persons and ideas. It sets up the gods and then has to worship them. Inspiration is derived from the temple and not from those who have built it. The institution after a while comes to be more important than the people in it, or even than those whom it is supposed to serve. So that is the role of priests, right? Uh, to carry on tradition. I think we all know, right, five gauss. Keep patients away from five gauss until they are screened. But how many people know where it came from? Who put that in there? How many people know we no longer have a five gauss line, that it's actually changed by most, most recommendations? There, right, that's the danger. In contrast, health for healthcare professionals, right, that's different. A profession is a group of men who claim or profess a special skill or competence, an art, to be exact, who are dedicated to this but they remain independent individuals and deal with the same on an equal plane. They are not absorbed into an institution nor bound by its traditions. Their inspiration is derived from many sources, not from one. So the whole point of me going off on a wild tangent is that I wanna make sure you know that uh, the, the way we develop MR safety needs to be through experiment and through rigorous debate. It can't be just following these manuals. So I, this is considered the gold standard but by all means, don't just read this and follow everything in it, please. And so when we talk about the effects of MRI, we're gonna be talking about the three fields, static magnetic field, gradient field, radio frequency field. The static magnetic field is gonna cause certain things, the gradient field causes other things, and the radio frequency field causes even more potential. Uh, detrimental effects in MRI. And through it all in the middle, we have artifacts. These can be caused by any of the fields and kind of are overarching whenever we're thinking about MR safety. And so the static magnetic field B0, of course, is generated uh, by the magnet. We use it to align all our protons in the patient. It is generally 1.5 or three Tesla for most scanners. And this is a fringe field map. So it's kind of like a topographic map here showing the field strength at different places. And again, uh, we've actually switched from five gauss to nine gauss line. And that's kind of the point uh, where we are worried that it could interact with certain devices such as CIEDs or pain pumps or that sort of thing. Um, and when thinking about B0 fields, keep in mind that they also extend vertically to the ceiling and down beneath the floor as well. Um, but the hazards of these static magnetic fields are that ferrous objects can experience two forces. There's the translational force that causes ferrous objects to be pulled towards the magnet and turns them into dangerous projectiles. You may all have heard stories about uh, oxygen cylinders and various things being sucked into the magnet. That's from the B0 field. And these forces tend to be greatest at the edges of the magnet. And it's actually zero in the center of the magnet, believe it or not. Once you're in the very center of the MRI, there's, there's no more pulling. Uh, there's also a torque or twisting force caused by B0 that causes ferromagnetic objects that are not spherical uh, to try to twist in the magnetic field. Those, unlike the translational force, are actually greatest in the center of the magnet. So if a patient has a clip that's ferromagnetic in them, I'm more worried when that's in the field and it's uh, right in the center of the magnet. Uh, there's also something called the lens effect caused by B0. This is actually more important when it uh, affects non-ferrous objects. So non-ferrous objects that are still conductive, that's key. So like aluminum, not ferrous like iron, but still conductive. And these objects still resist B0 and they produce a tugging sensation. This is important to note because sometimes a device might be MR conditional but you start putting the patient into a magnet and they're like, this is, I feel some tugging on this device. And sometimes people freak out and pull the patient out immediately. Don't do that. Um, that's normal. 
there is a tugging force even on non-ferromagnetic implants um, caused by the lens effect. I'll also note that the fringes of the stagnet, static magnetic field, or even the magnetic field itself, can interfere with implanted devices such as CIEDs and drug pumps, and that can result in potential injury or death. These devices contain uh, potentially reed switches, which work via magnets, so having another magnet can switch these. MRI can switch uh, pacemakers on and off. It can also cause drug pumps to empty based on the static magnetic field. So that's definitely a real hazard. And we talked about the projectile effect. So ferrous objects brought into the scan room, pulled at high speed. Again, be very careful uh, about screening and make sure ferrous objects are not brought into the scan room. Uh, B0, uh, in order to create that magnetic field, that's a superconducting magnet. And so there's cryogens within uh, the magnetic uh, cryostat. So the superconducting wire, we keep that at four degrees above absolute zero in most magnets. That's done using a whole lot of liquid helium traditionally. So we call a, a situation a quench. This is when helium suddenly boils off and expands almost a thousand times so one liter of helium can turn into 760 liters of gas. So that can build up a whole lot of pressure and displace the oxygen in the room. So there is a, usually a quench pipe that's supposed to vent this gas outside, but sometimes that fails and the magnet room fills with helium that displaces the oxygen and you can't really see because it's pretty foggy and that sort of stuff. Um, some places recommend glass hammers and outward swinging doors. Uh, glass hammers don't really do anything from personal experience, um, but yeah, the outward swinging doors definitely are recommended so that pressure gets released instead of people getting trapped inside. Also, you need to be aware of where the helium is venting, right? This is a lot of helium. You don't want your quench pipe to empty out right over a picnic table during lunchtime, for sure. Um, so that is kind of another hazard I, I tie with B0. A brief review of materials, because I've been talking about paramagnetic. Um, so we have three time, kinds of magnetism uh, when it comes to materials. We have diamagnetic. This kind of means non-magnetic. They're, they're technically weakly repelled by a magnetic field. I don't know if you've ever seen a video of the floating frogs in a magnetic field or whatever. That's how I actually started in MRI, was uh, levitating stuff. Um, but diamagnetic is basically non-magnetic. So water, wood, most organic compounds, gold, um, bismuth, that sort of stuff. The next uh, type of material we have is paramagnetic. So these are materials that become temporarily magnetized by an external field, uh, but that magnetism disappears when the field is removed. Um, gadolinium is the most important of these for MRI, right, our contrast agent. There's also ferromagnetic uh, substances so these are materials that, when exposed to a magnetic field, not only magnetize, but can stay magnetized permanently. So think about iron, cobalt, nickel, that sort of stuff. Potentially stainless steel. Some stainless steel is ferromagnetic. Some is not ferromagnetic. So you have to figure out which type of stainless steel it is. And we call these ferrous or ferromagnetic materials. I want to talk briefly about the four-zone concept in MRI. So the American College of Radiology, as well as the Joint Commission, uh, recommend this four zone concept to control access, right? Because if things get into zone four, say uh, a certain drug pumps or, or oxygen cylinders or patient beds that are not MR conditional, it can be a major issue, right? So we got to keep that stuff out. And so we uh, use this zone control uh, to help us do that. So generally, the hazards increase with zone number as we go from zone one to two to three to four, and access restrictions also increase with zone number. And it's best practice to label these zones and to train personnel so they know where the zones are and uh, what you have to do in each zone. So we'll start at zone one, and this is completely unrestricted. So this is the entrance to facilities or public hallways, right? We have no control over the entrance or the hallway or anything like that. So there's no restrictions, no monitoring for zone one. Then once somebody comes into our facility, this is, uh, we're in zone two. Zone two is kind of the interface between zone one, which is completely unrestricted, and zone three, which is very strictly controlled. And so when a patient comes into zone two, they're gonna be greeted, we're gonna start screening them, they're gonna change, that sort of stuff. 
And we say that patients and non-MR personnel, that means people who have not trained in MR safety, should be under kind of the supervision of trained MR personnel. It doesn't need to be, you know, eyes on this person, but generally you should know where these patients are and what they're up to and that sort of thing. Zone three, so here's uh, the strictly uh, controlled one. So this is where things get serious and risks increase. Uh, this is usually the MR control room and access is strictly restricted. So we have locks, it's monitored by MR personnel. Uh, we take safety very seriously at zone three. So ferromagnetic objects should be prevented from entering zone three when possible. Patients should be screened and gowned before entering zone three. And staff within zone three should all have MR safety training and be screened themselves too. Zone four, finally, we get to the magnet room. Uh, this is old, obviously, it's now nine gauss, uh, but wherever the field exceeds nine gauss, we can also consider that zone four. It needs to be clearly marked with signage to indicate potential dangers. And of course, access is strictly restricted. We have locks on these doors as well, and we require a observation line of sight by MR personnel for patients and non-MR personnel. And just a reminder, ferromagnetic objects can and have killed if brought into zone four. A quick note about medical emergencies that occur in zone four, because sometimes they're scanning a patient and they code it right in the scanner. Um, how do you handle that? Well, you can usually start uh, CPR in zone four. It depends on your table um, that the patient is being scanned on the bed. Uh, most beds allow for CPR to be performed on them. Um, but it's important to note that no crash carts or external defibrillators are permitted in zone four. You try to bring that in, they could fly into the scanner, and then suddenly you're dealing with two emergencies in zone four. So uh, the, the rule of thumb is to the patient should be quickly moved out of the magnet room for the full resuscitation efforts. Um, obviously, you call a code and deal with that, but the code should be done somewhere outside of zone four. We try to remove them all the way to zone two uh, while someone's performing CPR on the bed and do stuff out there. You have to be very careful about running a code in MRI. All right, so we talked a lot about V0. Uh, next, I want to talk about our second magnetic field. Uh, we'll call this G, GI. These are the gradient fields, right? The gradient fields are what we use to localize our signal in MRI. And so uh, the gradient fields themselves are switching on and off during imaging. They create their own hazards. Uh, the biggest hazard is actually acoustic noise, usually. Uh, they're very loud, these, these gradient uh, generators. So the, the noise is caused by vibration of the gradient coils due to the rapidly switching electrical currents. And these can cause both pain as well as temporary or even permanent loss of hearing. So patients and others in the scan room during scanning must wear hearing protection. That reduces the sound uh, level. We say the A-weighted RMS sound to below 99 decibels, which you see over here is quieter than the subway. Of course, we try to go down further than that. That's kind of the bare minimum is, is what we call subway or underground levels of sound or motorcycle we can usually aim for. Uh, we can usually get down to like busy road. So um, just, just know that. And different sequences have different uh, acoustic noise. So yeah, once you get to the EPI, it can get quite loud. So we need to make sure uh, we're providing hearing protection for the patients. Uh, I will note about 20% of reported MR injuries are actually hearing damage. So it's, it should be mandatory, uh, the hearing protection, and it should be two forms of hearing protection and make sure it gets put in. Don't just like hand the patient earplugs and say, make sure you put these in, make sure it's done right. Um, and that's for everybody in the scanner room. If you ha are scanning a kid and the pa parent is staying in the room, they need hearing protection as well. Another potential issue with these gradient fields is that the rapidly switched uh, magnetic field gradients can result in uncomfortable or painful peripheral nerve stimulation. So MR operators can reduce the probability of PNS by using normal operating mode for DVDT, um, but I don't know, I think that's rarely necessary. Uh, with PNS, it's uncomfortable, but there's no permanent damage. I think it's more important just to be aware of the potential for PNS. So again, this occurs when we have rapidly switching gradients. Again, I'm thinking EPI. So if a patient is complaining of something painful during EPI, especially in their fingertips, it's probably less likely to be a burn 
or thermal damage, which we'll talk about next, and more likely to be this peripheral nerve stimulation. And again, no permanent damage generally, um, just kind of usually tingling, or if you are if you ever had an arm or a leg fall asleep, it kind of feels like that. Um, so uh, it's, it's more important just to be aware of this. In contrast, um, another potential gradient field hazard that can be quite dangerous is that uh, devices and implants in the field may experience induced voltages uh, from this uh, gradient field. So for example, abandoned leads for cardiac pacemakers, uh, they actually don't heat up as much as we thought they would. But a bigger issue is these gradient field hazards. You can induce a voltage into that wire. That wire is, has one side right in the heart tissue. So you can actually induce arrhythmias um, if you're really pushing your gradients hard um, and, and the wire is right where the gradients are the greatest. So if you're doing like a head scan, your gradients are gonna be the greatest, uh, you know, a bit further away. And look, that's right over the heart. And if there's an abandoned lead right there, you can induce quite a bit of voltage and, and potentially cause an arrhythmia. So that's an important thing to remember. Uh, the third field, so we've talked about B0, our static magnetic field, G, our gradient fields. Now we're going to talk about B1, which is our RF field. So this is the field that's uh, generated by the coil, right? Um, usually, uh, most MRI systems, the transmit coil is actually built into the scanner. And there's a big quadrature body coil built into the scanner that's generating uh, this field. If you're using a TR coil, of course, the TR coil is probably the one generating this field. And the main hazard with this B1 field is heating. Uh, it's kind of works similar to a microwave. So uh, the more power we put in, these RF fields can uh, induce currents within a patient and create heating. So two thirds of reported MR injuries are burns. And we kind of differentiate, we group these into three types of thermal injuries. Uh, direct contact, where the patient touches the bore of the scanner, which is hot. Uh, conductive loop that's formed by external conductors or the patient's body. And the resonance phenomena. Those are kind of the three way we see uh, thermal injuries. So for the near field or local effect, this is uh, touching the bore of the magnet, which generally heats up during scanning. And so uh, most common, of course, in obese and large patients, which are much more likely to touch the bore. And so the way you prevent this, of course, is proper patient positioning and the use of padding. The patient's skin should never touch the bore of the scanner. Uh, conductive loops in the electric field of the B1 cause a charge buildup at pinch points. So uh, you see some pictures here, but you can see kind of on the diagram here, we have a pinch point. So there's current that's generated uh, by these RF fields and it's flowing through the patient. And if there's just a tiny point of contact, all that current gets pushed into a very tiny area, and then it becomes substantial enough to cause the burn. You actually don't have problems if you have like large areas of contact. The problem is more the small areas of contact. You're kind of con uh, con concentrating all that current into a small place. And so we see these right where patients are potentially touching themselves. Inner thighs are a very common point. Um, also the hand or finger contact. We also see these uh, corners and metallic implants, objects, or devices. They can uh, concentrate the current as well, or metallic fibers and clothing and fabric. Uh, we're seeing more and more of that. So again, no loops, right? Keep pads around all the patient. There should not be any patient loops to prevent burns. Uh, the resonance phenomena, that is kind of the third uh, category of the way we get thermal injuries. So wires and elongated conductive objects act like antennas in the RF field. Uh, so you produce standing wave patterns of voltage and current that are concentrated near the tips. So it's the tips that generally heat up. This is showing a DBS, deep brain stimulator. And so obviously uh, the antennas work better when their length is at the resonant frequency. So the we tend to see uh, maximal heating when the length is either the wavelength of our RF uh, frequency or even quarter or half wavelengths, just kind of fractional uh, parts of that wavelength. And the greatest heating again, exposed at exposed non-insulated wires, lead tips, that sort of thing. And so I always check the shape of uh, and length 
of the device or object if when you're kind of doing a, a assessment of the risks here. Um, for uh, reference, the ref resonance lengths, it generally decreases at higher fields. So we're generally more worried about this at high fields because we have a whole lot of stuff that's, you know, four to six centimeters. We kind of have less stuff in the 25 centimeter range where we're worried in 1.5 T, but it still happens. Um, external fixation devices and stuff like that can definitely heat up and uh, through resonance or really long leads. Sometimes they have to implant a device, you know, in the stomach or lower back and run leads all the way up to, you know, pretty high in the patient. Uh, those, those can definitely resonate and cause heating. So because heating are, again, most of our injuries in MRI, I, I want to uh, give you a, reiterate the ways to mitigate uh, thermal injuries. One, avoid direct patient contact with the bore or any coils in there, in the uh, bore. Avoid loops, including those created by skin-to-skin -skin contact. Again, common places are gonna be the inner thighs, uh, fingers, also a paniculus if your patient has one. You have to use proper padding to space stuff out. And I'm, by proper padding, I mean use the pads that came with your MRI system. They should be at least a centimeter. Sheets are not good enough. Uh, remove unnecessary electrical conductors. Um, you know, uh, we've seen a lot of burns caused by EKG leads and that sort of thing. If they're not designed for MRI, make sure those are off on a patient if you're bringing in an inpatient. Um, and if there's electrical conductors that need to remain that are MR conditional, you've checked, uh, try to insulate them and remove loops. By insulate, I mean put padding again between the wire and the patient and uh, yeah, remove any sort of loops within there. Try to have a straight run uh, straight out of the bore. Have patients change out of street clothes. Again, we're seeing more and more clothes that have metal in them uh, for antimicrobial reasons. Remove transdermal patches if possible. Um, that, uh, of course, is a risk-benefit assessment. Depends on what kind of transdermal patch it is, but some patients have medication patches. Uh, remove those if possible. And uh, with large tattoos, consider ice packs. So, all right, we talked about the hazards that's from the three different fields. How do we know if an implant or something is safe to bring into the MR environment or not? Uh, well, there's labeling. Everything should be labeled. And so there's three potential labels here. The first is MR safe. That's the green square. And these objects are safe in all MR environments. You don't even have to think about it. Uh, so there's no conditions or restrictions. And it's reserved for non-metallic objects, also non-magnetic or non-conductive uh, objects. And next we have the yellow triangle, which is MR conditional. This means it's safe in if you meet certain conditions. Um, it's then potentially unsafe if you're not meeting those conditions. And finally, we have what's known as MR unsafe. There are known safety risks in the MR environment, uh, primarily ferromagnetic objects. That said, even though there are risks, I don't like the symbol, right? The, the strike through MR, because there's definitely plenty of patients we scan uh, with unsafe devices. Um, because we determine that the potential benefits outweigh the risks. There are known risks, but uh, we feel that the benefits outweigh the risks. So I, I, I don't like this symbol because I still would consider MR in most of these patients. Um, but of course, some of them, the risks outweigh the benefits and we don't do MRI, uh, but it's never absolute. No, the, the, the label should not be determining patient care, right? It's a radiologist that should be determining it. I will also note that historically, Several companies have just slapped down this unsafe um, label if a device was untested. It was kind of a guilty until proven innocent sort of thing, where if you didn't test your device, you just said, oh, it's probably it's unsafe because I cannot uh, have not run the test to verify that it can be scanned. So sometimes unsafe does not actually mean unsafe. Sometimes it means untested, just FYI. And I just want to say, again, one of the most important things here, the single most reliable source, whether the implant is safe, conditional, or unsafe, is the manufacturer, right? Um, don't always trust Google. Don't always uh, trust various databases or mrisafety.com, even though it's a very good resource. Uh, always check with the manufacturer if you have any doubts. Uh, you can go to their website. You can call them. 
um, but they're the ones who can tell you the current status of the implant. Uh, note that the current the status of the implant may change over time. I've definitely seen objects change categories from unsafe to conditional. And likewise, I've seen conditions change over time, especially with uh, deep brain stimulators. So I always make sure you're looking up the new or, or the most recent safety information. If you had a device, you know, a few years ago and you're now scanning it again today, uh, just double check that it's the most current information it is best practice because these uh, conditions do change. And so what kind of conditions are we talking about when we're saying MR conditional? Uh, there may be all sorts of conditions. It could be on the static field strength. Maybe you can only scan at 1.5T and not 3T. Uh, maybe the spatial field gradient. That's the thing that kind of produces, uh, that's related to B0 and it kind of produces the pulling force. Uh, the type of coil. Maybe we can only use a transmit receive head coil on this patient. Maybe we cannot use a transmit and receive head coil on this patient. There could be conditions on SAR, B1 plus RMS. That's our transmit power we're putting into the patient. Uh, the duration of single series or entire scanning session. So maybe we can only scan for 15 minutes. Uh, time varying gradient screw rate. Uh, for example, they might say you have to be limited to 200 um, millitesla per second, per centimeter, yes. Uh, landmarking or centering. Maybe you can only landmark at certain places on the patient's body. Uh, maybe there are conditions on the location of the device in the patient body. You can scan the patient on label if it's over here, but you cannot if it's over there. Uh, the location of the device in the RF field. Maybe as long as the device is outside of the coil, you're okay. Uh, there might be also conditions on patient monitoring, right? We might have to monitor the patient for uh, these pacemakers. We typically have more advanced monitoring, uh, not just the stuff that came with the scanner, but a, a separate monitoring system. And that's gonna be monitored by an ACLS qualified uh, nurse. So a nurse that's trained in recognizing EKG signals and, and can react to that. I talked about SAR, so I wanna mention what SAR is. So SAR is the specific absorption rate which is the amount of power, you can think of that as heat, deposited into tissue by our RF irradiation per unit mass. And it's going to be proportional to B naught squared times alpha squared times D. Uh, don't worry, there's no test later, but I just want you to kind of think about how SAR generally goes up with increasing B0. It also definitely goes up with the RF pulse flip angle. So if you have a SAR limitation and you need to bring down SAR a little bit on your sequence, uh, one of the best ways to do that is to reduce the flip angles, especially if you're using a spin echo sequence, the refocusing angle, right? Those 180 degree pulses have a whole lot of uh, SAR in them. They, they heat quite a bit. And so we can easily bring uh, generally a 180 degree pulse down to about 120 degrees, greatly reduce SAR and still get pretty good image quality. Uh, D is the duty cycle, and SAR does depend on patient size because it's uh, uh, it's uh, right. It's R for radiation per unit mass. So make sure when you have, especially if you have a SAR limitation, that you are entering the mass correctly. Although that's important for patients even uh, without any sort of implants. So always make sure you know how much your patient weighs and enter that into the scanner. Uh, the scanner is using that to figure out how much power it can deposit in that patient. It matters even in patients without implants because there are FTA or IEC SAR limits, uh, IEC being the International Electrotechnical Commission that also uh, kind of governs uh, MR safety internationally. And so these are their SAR limits. And so for whole body, so for doing like an abdomen, we're usually in normal operating mode so our SAR limit is two watts per kilogram. And we have different levels. If, we, if a radiologist determines uh, benefits potentially exceed the risks, you can go to first level, which is four watts per kilograms. Um, and then there's also technically second level that is never used clinically, it's only used in research. Um, but uh, the point I wanna make too is that, again, if you enter the mass in, uh, incorrectly for a patient, it's gonna do weird things and, and you can affect image quality or potentially a uh, risk safety. Uh, the head has slightly different SAR limits than the whole body. So where are we at? Let's talk patient screening. 
So we obviously screen our patients to make sure they're safe in MRI. Um, there's a whole screening process. I want to leave time for questions, so I won't go too in depth on most of these things. Um, but we always have a patient fill out a form, uh, ask lots of questions just to make sure it's safe to go into MRI. We also uh, will often put patients past a ferromagnetic detector uh, to just make sure there's nothing on them that we forgot about. We commonly discover weird stuff uh, like the life alerts. In, in this country, we have these uh, devices that patients sometimes wear around their neck. If they fall, they can hit it and it calls for help. And so some of them forget to take that off and we catch it with these. But I will also note that ferromagnetic detectors, uh, one, they, you should know that um, they don't catch everything, especially if it's deep in a patient. So don't rely on ferromagnetic detectors. Also, the magnetic field from these ferromagnetic detectors actually exceeds uh, nine gauss. So um, yeah, make sure you know if a patient has a pacemaker before you put them in front of these. Pregnant patients, uh, generally safe. Uh, still, we, we like to delay MR until after pregnancy if they don't actually need the MR. But if they need the MR, we just go ahead and scan them. Uh, the only thing we worry about are contrast agents. These can de definitely cross the placenta, and we don't know exactly what they're going to do. Um, so we, we're very careful about using contrast uh, with pregnant patients. That should be uh, There should be a risk-benefit analysis and informed consent if you're planning to do that. And generally, if we have pregnant staff, we ask them not to remain in the scan room while scanning, uh, just out of an abundance of caution. There's no actual evidence. So the, we, we have different responsibilities for different personnel in MRI. Uh, we like to differentiate between the MRSO, the MRSE, and the MRMD. The MRSO is the one uh, that's usually technologist. They're the ones screening patients, researching implants, that sort of stuff. And they provide information uh, to the radiologist or MRSC uh, if the safety status is unknown or if they have any questions that they, they kind of elevate it. Uh, generally, though, if they can, uh, if a device is conditional uh, or part of covered on a policy, they just scan if they can meet the conditions. If they cannot meet the conditions or it's something they don't know about, then it, it gets elevated. The MRSC, I have an MRSC myself uh, for a large health system. And so that's usually an MR physicist. We provide technical expertise in MR physics and safety to technologists and radiologists. We, we, we answer the hard questions. Uh, the radiologist or MRMD is the captain of the ship. Um, so they have the ultimate responsibility for the operational safety and safe performance of exams. Um, I, I think that's pretty universal internationally that at the end of the day, it, it's all the MRMD uh, that's in charge. They also perform the risk versus benefit analyses. Let's see. I'm going to skip over. Well, I'll just talk about a couple of real world examples. That's probably more useful than some of the other stuff. Now, again, if there's anything specific, I'll save some time at the end. I prepared like hundreds of slides just in case uh, any sort of question comes up. All right, let's talk bullets, shrapnel. This is a common one. So when in general, when I am thinking about MR safety, right? If someone calls me and say, okay, there's something in this patient, is it safe to scan this patient? I go back to the three fields that we just talked about. So if I'm called and I'm told that there's a bullet or shrapnel in a patient, I'm thinking the three fields. Um, for B0, that's one I'm usually most concerned about for bullet and shrapnel, right? Well, most pellets or bullets are minimally ferromagnetic although there are some notable exceptions, especially armor-piercing shot, shrapnel is often ferromagnetic. So that's what I'm going to be mostly worried about, is that fact that there could be some pulling forces or some twisting forces uh, on uh, the shrapnel. Uh, regarding D1, this is, again, the thing that causes heating. Heating is not usually significant for implants smaller than a dime, uh, except in the eye. So if it's not in the eye and it's just like a normal bullet, I'm not too worried about heating. And gradients, usually not an issue uh, specifically for bolts or shrapnel. So for like bolts and shrapnel, the first three rules uh, of how risky it is are the same as the three most important things for real estate, uh, location, location, location. And so, right, if this is right on top of a major blood vessel or the spinal cord, I'm much more worried than if it's in like a hunk of muscle, um, right? 
And so testing may also determine if a material is ferromagnetic. We can uh, potentially use CT to determine that. Or if we uh, know what kind it is, we can test a similar bullet. Uh, several studies have shown generally no adverse effects uh, for, for most bullets in shrapnel, but caution is certainly warranted. And I certainly wouldn't scan if there were any questions or if it was located again uh, near a major blood vessel or a, a, a spinal cord. You, you kind of got to assume that whatever it is, it's likely going to move a little bit or um, twist a little bit. And yeah, artifacts, I will note, can be significant uh, with these. Again, risk-benefit assessment has to be done for each patient to determine if they should be scanned or not. Uh, tattoos, we often get questions about tattoos. Uh, B0, static field, not usually a problem with tattoos, except I will say that uh, within about two days after a new tattoo is put on, uh, you the B0 can actually cause a little bit of smearing. Um, so patients, not a, not a hazard per se, except that patients really don't like it if you smear their tattoo. Um, the radiance, not an issue with tattoos, our risk is generally B1. Uh, heating is definitely possible if the ma material is conductive or large. And so most tattoos, I, I will say again, are very low risk, um, but keep using those burn prevention measures we talked about and be wary of large tattoos or tattoos uh, from, we kind of say, uh, low income countries or prison or that sort of stuff. There's more likely to be conductive material and consider uh, making sure that the patient is conscious and um, applying a cold compress to it if, if you're worried about it. Infusion pumps, uh, this comes up too. I will say anything is possible with infusion pumps. There have definitely been uh, multiple deaths from a scanning these. It, it's absolutely critical to identify uh, the infusion pump and the cargo. Uh, don't take the patient's word that the pump is empty. I uh, get some questions about MRI and anesthesia, and I would defer you to other sources, um, but generally there, there's some very good consensus documents. It is possible to do MRI and anesthesia relatively safely, uh, just kind of follow the guidelines. Uh, GBCAs, just know that there's new group two agents, um, no new updates on GBCAs and pregnancies. Uh, if you're trying to figure out your policy on contrast agents, these are gadolinium-based contrast agents. Uh, the ACR has an excellent manual on contrast media that was updated last year. There's also a great consensus statement uh, from the ACR and the National Kidney Foundation. I'm going to skip over this types of injuries. I will just note that, the um, again, I personally went through uh, at the FDA's database that's here in the U.S. and figured out where our injuries are. And again, mostly thermal, although it's uh, no longer two-thirds. I'm now seeing like closer to half, um, but yeah, still a major issue. Mechanical, um, these are like when you pinch fingers and stuff like that, we're again, moving parts. Acoustic, that's why hearing protection is important. And then we see projectile over here. So projectile often gets the most uh, headlines in the newspaper, but it's certainly not our biggest uh, source of injuries in MRI. Uh, there are also two deaths actually uh, related to CIEDs in the US uh, over the past year. All right, I think I'm gonna skip most of this stuff. Yeah, let's see, how am I doing on time? All right, I think I'll just, uh, the only last thing I wanna say is that in the United States, we often have these good to go lists, which say we can kind of scan this stuff no matter what. Um, we, do, we don't really research it too in depth. For example, coronary artery stents, I think are pretty common. Uh, but all this uh, good to go stuff kind of goes out the window when you're in um, more resource limited settings. Uh, we have no idea what the materials are used. So the, the point is for those of you internationally in a country with a very different healthcare system than the United States, please be wary of using um, guidelines from the United States in that uh, the, the, we know what's been implanted in the United States and it's different materials, um, different implants, that sort of thing. Uh, don't just kind of look at manuals or the ACR guidance and say, oh, uh, coronary artery stents are fine. Uh, it, you kind of have to be a bit more wary uh, when you don't know when it was implanted and uh, or where it was implanted. That's all I want to say about that. Um, so this was good.
we got through a bunch of stuff. Um, I can obviously talk about MR safety for like weeks, uh, but but that's that's what I have for now. So I will certainly take any questions you have or 